Welcome everyone once again to World Lit. Uh, the Bangal Literature Festival uh, typically pops up once a year. We'll see how that goes this year. Uh, and many thousands of readers and a few hundred writers coming together each year uh, for stimulating conversations and uh, engaged debates. And we've wondered for some time now about uh, ways to continue uh, engaging with our audiences through the year. And uh, that's really what World Lit is about. It's the Bangal Literature Festival's digital literary platform uh, bringing to you live stream sessions, uh, video interviews, and uh, podcasts with leading international and Indian authors. Uh, today, we are delighted to welcome Pico Ayer and Saman Subramanian. Uh, Pico is a prolific novelist and nonfiction author who writes on a wide range of subjects, uh, ranging from uh, uh, home to travel to the 21st century global order. Pico, we're absolutely delighted to have you here uh, as part of World Lit. Uh, we've been wooing you for a few years now, and uh, you've <laughs> promised you'd make it to Bangalore. Uh, glad you're here, albeit virtually. Uh, Saman Subramanian is a writer and journalist, uh, most recently uh, the author of uh, JBS Haldane's biography. Uh, Saman, we were looking forward to having you uh, at, in Bangalore this year uh, to talk about your most recent book. Uh, hope to be able to do that sometime. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Saman, to uh, take it away. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Pico, welcome. I mean, this is, uh, this is really special for me because somebody who um, I grew up reading and adoring. Uh, at some point, I remember, this is a personal anecdote, but when I was in college studying journalism, um, my full sort of name on my passport and on my degree and so on is Samant Subramanian Iyer. And uh, one of my journalism professors at some point asked me, saying, are you related to Pico Ayer? And I said, you know, I could only in my mind say I wish. Um, and, you know, I've been bumping into Pico off and on in festivals and readings and so on. Uh, but this is really the first extended conversation we're going to have. Uh, and I've, I, I've been waiting for this for years. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, tell us where you are, Pico. Where are you right now? How have you spent the last few months. Um, I know your life is sort of divided between two countries. So which of these countries are you in right now? Uh, just before I answer that, I want to say, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but I feel I've grown up reading you. And honestly, uh, I read your book, This Divided Island, for the third time last month. I was actually taking notes. And it's given me huge hope for the future of writing and for brilliant reporting. And I feel what I and my generation have done, you're really bringing into a whole new world. So um, it's a huge honor for me to talk to you. And I'm so oh, thank thrilled you. to make the time. Um, yes, I do, I do go back and forth between Japan and California. And I've been in both of them during this strange season. I spent the first half of the spring uh, in Japan, which was absolutely radiant. And of course, mm -hmm. being Japan, sane, relatively unperturbed by circumstances, very much looking like normal. In the middle of April, I was playing ping pong with my elderly friends and 81 year old men were diving across the hard wooden floor of the gym to hit back forehand. So it was a lovely um, gift to be in Japan. Far fewer visitors than normal, but otherwise flowering cherry trees and nightingales everywhere. And then I, in mid-April, I flew back to California, partly because my mother, who's now 89, had been in the hospital and I wanted to be mm -hmm. with her. So, and it's no, so I'm currently in, in Santa Barbara, California, just down the street from where my mother lives. It's certainly not a hardship posting, a, a brilliant, right. beautiful, right. connected resort town. Um, but I'm chafing yeah. to be back in Japan. And there are no flights um, flying to Japan yet? Oddly, there are. There's a daily flight okay. uh, back and forth between uh, Tokyo and San Francisco, which is how I came over, and I'm hoping to be back soon. Though, understandably, mm -hmm. the Japanese are not so eager to see people from the U.S. for now. Um, right. And what happened, uh, I mean, after you came over um, in mid-April, what happened? I mean, you must have been following the unfolding of the pandemic in Japan from afar. What has that been like? I mean, what has, how has Japan coped with it? And how's your family doing? Well, thank you. I mean, one of my embarrassing secrets is I try very hard not to follow the news. And during this pandemic, right. especially no more than two minutes a day, if that. So you may well know more about what's happening in Japan than I do. My family and everybody seems fine. Japan apparently has opened up almost entirely. Uh, and as, again, you know, maybe more, they've somehow navigated this whereby there hasn't been testing, but 
there have been very, very few cases. And, and I think it's partly because in Japan, people are used to wearing masks anyway during the mm -hmm. winter to protect others from germs. <clears throat> and also, of course, a very obedient and disciplined and extraordinarily clean culture. So um, I think they have exactly the right sensibility for knowing how to deal with catastrophe. And it's interesting, I think I, I almost moved to Japan because I felt it was such a seasoned elder at dealing with suffering compared with the United States. Uh, right. And I think this right. day when the tsunami or something in Japan and all of the rest of the world follows on television, they're taken aback at how uncomplaining and quiet and almost accepting the Japanese are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I was preparing for this conversation is that uh, in the last few months, a lot of us around the world uh, to varying degrees have led what I might call the Pico Ayer life, which is a <laughs> life of relative solitude and isolation. Um, you stay at home, you attend to the small parts of your life uh, and, and see the bigger significance in those small things. Um, you read a lot and you write and so on. Uh, and you've been doing this obviously for years, uh, if not decades. And so I wonder if you have a sense of how the rest of us are doing at this uh, because your best place to judge, I mean, you know, how do you think modern society, either in the US or in Europe or even in Japan, uh, is primed to go into these kind of periods of isolation and handle them well? It's a lovely question. I really feel solitude is a test, but it's a test we can't afford to look away from or pretend doesn't right. exist. Um, in recent weeks, I've been thinking a lot about this sentence from Sherry Turkle, who's at MIT and investigates family life in the digital age, and has said wonderfully, if you don't know how to be alone, you'll always be lonely. So to speak to your question, I think solitude is a test that many people fail. As you say, I'm lucky. Uh, I've been living in a chosen semi-permanent lockdown for 34 years, and it's being out <laughs> in company that, that, that I fail. You know, I'm not very good at being out in the world, but I'm more than comfortable just being sitting at, at my desk. But many others are the opposite and have really been unsettled by this moment. But I think um, it's an important moment, partly because... The main sentence I've heard for the last 10 or 15 years from all my friends, sometimes from myself, is I don't have time. I don't have time right. to keep up with my friends or be with my family or read a book or take a walk or listen to music. And suddenly this virus has been a wake up call and forced us to address the things we often run away from or have been crying out that we're missing. Because I think most of us have felt some clarity and stability and equilibrium missing in our lives. Our lives have almost been out of balance and out of control. And this has given us, I think, a chance to take control over the, our lives, but only by seeing solitude as the place in which we gather our inner resources. And our outer lives are only as rich as our inner resources are going to be. So it's almost like building up one's inner savings account, I think. And I mean, for example, when, when my mother came out of the hospital a few weeks ago, and I flew back to be with her, and as I was sitting next to her, I thought, the books I've written, the books I've read, the travels I've undertaken, none of that's going to help her. The only thing that can help her and support me is whatever I've gathered inside. And I can only gather that inside, I feel, by being alone. Um, traveling the world or, or chit-chatting is not really going to build me up in the, ma in the ways that can help me and help the people around me. But uh, your question is a wonderful one because I, I know many of my friends have been very unsettled by it. I think one of the unexpected things for me is my elder friends, people in their 70s or 80s, have, have seemed to cherish this moment and really savor mm -hmm. it. And it may be because they have much less future in front of them. But it may also be because they've over the years learned how to live with themselves and their pursuits are much quieter and also maybe they have less energy to be out in the world. But I found the 80-year-olds who are physically at greatest risk are psychologically most um, undisturbed. And it's my friends right. in the 50s and 40s who seem very rattled. Um, I don't know right. what, what you found among your contemporaries, probably a lot of anxiety, financial and every other way. I mean, that's definitely there. I, I feel like I, again, like you almost, uh, I'm in somewhat of a unique position because I've been used to being at home now for a decade. I work from home, except when I go out to report something, I then come back and I'm sort of by myself. And I've learned maybe not to the extent that you have, but I've learned to sort of be okay with that, that kind of life. Uh, but I see this a lot among my friends who are used to going to work every day and coming back and uh, 
uh, and having a social life that revolves around both work uh, and their activities outside the home. And uh, there's a certain amount of discomfort and anxiety about missing that. Uh, you know, the the term FOMO is sort of uh, is used quite often, you know, fear of missing out. There's really nothing that you're missing out on here if you're sitting at home because everybody is sitting at home. So there should be no fear. There should be no anxiety. There's, <laughs> yes, there's yes. no party out there that you're not being invited to. But, um, but it exists nonetheless. There's still something, or maybe it's just a, a question of time that is being sort of leached out of your life as well. I mean, we've now all, all been in lockdown for close to three or four months. Um, mm. It's a sizable section of your life. In India, for example, I know that lockdown will continue well into July in many cities. So uh, I think for people who are sort of engaged in the day to day grind, um, there is a genuine concern about where the paychecks will come from or where the um, where their jobs will go. Uh, and I, you know, I know, of course, that this is something where you were once, uh, like me, a jobbing journalist, you were at Time magazine. Um, and you talk in autumn light, uh, one of your two new books about uh, your decision to move to Japan. And I was wondering if you could tell me about the state of mind that you were in that led you to seek that kind of solitude at that particular point of time. I mean, what was going through your mind? Where was your mind at when you decided to go walk about during your layover in, in Japan and then just <laughs> decided to stay? Yes, thank you. I think, so I was 29 years old when I made that move. I'd had four exhilarating years at Time Magazine, which was really, having come from graduate school, school a crash course in communication and learning to try to write with clarity and concreteness and concision. But Unlike you, I think I was in this curious position whereby I was writing vivid eyewitness accounts of places I had never seen while sitting in my New York office. So first I thought far more interesting and, and vital to engage with them firsthand and write about them from afar. But I think more deeply, I felt that growing up, especially as somebody born in England, I had partaken of the gospel of possibility, of possibility and the beauty right. of the future tense, which is the main thing America has to offer. And as I neared 30, I thought, well, now I need to learn about reality. And now I need to move from learning about the pursuit of happiness to learning about the reality of suffering, that Buddhist truth. So as I was intimating before, in some ways I moved to Japan to, as one would consult a wise elder who'd spent 1400 years living with grief and loss and difficulty and negotiating it quite calmly. Uh, and I also thought whatever happens in a temple in Kyoto is going to be radically different from what I've experienced in midtown Manhattan. And, you know, I had no dependence. I knew I could live simply. And I thought, well, this is an adventure and a chance to live by very different values than the ones that I've lived in uh, in New York. And, you know, from all your travels among metropolitan centers in New York, especially, I found it very hard to live by values other than those of New York. Whereas I thought, mm -hmm. in a foreigner, as a foreigner in a country where I barely speak the language, I'm going to have to forge my own values and it'll give me a chance to pursue them. And I, even as a young, younger person, I'd been haunted by that line from Henry David Thoreau, I didn't want to die feeling I'd never lived. And so I had something unresolved in me and I thought going to Japan <clears throat> would, would fulfill that. And, um, and indeed, I think it did. And just before I forget, I loved what you were saying a minute ago about fear of missing out. And what you brought home to me in what you said was this moment has allowed us to take, to open our eyes to everything we've been taking for granted. So I've been thinking about how for many people, this virus moment has allowed us to remember how nice it is to be with family, to have home cooked meals, to take walks around the neighborhood. But I think you also pointed out um, for those who are in an office, it reminds them of the beauties of being in an office. Probably when you're making the commute every day, you're complaining about that process. But now people stuck at home are remembering how they miss the camaraderie. They miss the jostle and, and friction and stimulation of being with other people. So um, any form of deprivation actually uh, opens our eyes to the things that we haven't been noticing enough, maybe. That's true. Uh, one of the things that I've been reading a lot about is how people during this lockdown um, have come to terms with what is important in their lives. You know, what, as you so nicely put it, what feels real and what feel, doesn't feel real? What are the values that you need to cherish and what are the values uh, that you've been chasing that are perhaps a little hollow or false? Um, and you uh, clearly at this age at 29, when you decided to make this move, there was, um, I mean, it's unusual for somebody who's 29 to come to that realization. And I'm 
Um, could you sort of, in as um, sort of a snapshotty way as possible, tell us what brought you to that stage where you could, at the age of 29 even, uh, come to think about these things such as values and reality and um, and this exercise of weighing what is important and what isn't, when people much older in the modern age still fail to do it unless it's imposed on them artificially in the form of lockdown. I think it's easier to do when you're young and when you're free to responsibilities. And of course, I'm retrospectively placing you know, wisdom and importance on what was probably just an intuitive wish to try something new and the feeling that I'd got what I could possibly learn from New York City and Time Magazine and now I had to move on to the next thing. But it all came, as, as you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, from just this unwanted 20-hour layover in Tokyo airport on my way back from Hong Kong to New York City as I walked around the little town of Narita. And late October day, blazing blue skies, the first pinch of coming cold and approaching darkness. And something in that moment pierced me. And I felt I know this place. And I know this place better than I know the street on which I grew up on, uh, in England, better than the apartment where I live in New York City. And if I don't come back here, something in me is always going to be unsatisfied. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life in New York, wondering what it might be um, to live in Japan. And so since I was relatively mobile and since my needs were simple, um, I thought I've got to put this, this intuition to the test. Uh, and the older I've got, the more I trust intuition and the more I realize that any decision I come to rationally uh, by weighing up pros and cons is unlikely to have real force. I'm much more trusting of the moments that come to us inexplicably. So that was one such, just an unwanted layover. And I felt such a sense of familiarity and recognition. I thought, I have to act on this. And so right. by the time I boarded my plane back to New York, as you know, I decided to move to Japan and I did uh, three years later. Um, and I think it was just, New York was a wonderful place uh, both to be and to leave because it's a, it's a crash course and an immersion in, in worldliness and speed and, and exhilaration. And in that very process, it reminds you of what you're missing, which is slowness and reflection and, and the chance to live more independently. So I think four years was just enough time to allow me to think, this, this place has taught me a lot, but now I need to learn from a different teacher. Right. And what is it about... Uh, Japan, and I guess in a sense I'm asking you a question that you've answered through multiple books, but so that's sort of unfair of me, but what is it about Japan and the way the society is set up that uh, encourages sort of a certain self-containment, a certain uh, peace with being in solitude? Self-containment is, is a wonderful word, and it's an interesting word in the context of such a community-minded culture, but you're absolutely right. And I, did, I do think that I sensed very quickly that Kyoto was a contemplative place, and therefore very much the inverse of New York City. Uh, as you know, right. you know, Kyoto, the ancient city, has 1,600 uh, Buddhist temples there and 400 Shinto shrines. And although it's a busy modern city, its foundations for 1300 years now have been those of reflection and quiet. And I suppose I felt growing up in England and the United States that I'd been taught how to speak, how to decorate my resume, how to push myself forwards. But Japan would be the place where I'd learned to listen and where I'd learned to become invisible in some sense and how I'd learn much more about inner resources than external. Most of all, because I was a, a foreigner and can speak so little of the language. So I'm kind of condemned to a useful sort of <laughs> silence. There. I can't chit chat in, in Japan. <laughs> too. Um, and, you know, I, as you know, I wrote, write in my book, um, Autumn Light, quite a lot about ping pong. And the reason I spend a lot of time on the seemingly trivial subject is when I started playing ping pong in my neighborhood in Nara 16 years ago, the first thing I noticed that was that we only play doubles. And the second right. thing I noticed was that we choose our partners by lots and we change partners every five minutes. So if you happen to uh, lose one game, you're likely to win six minutes later. And the third thing I noticed was that everyone is keeping track of the score of the game, but nobody is keeping track of who's winning overall. And so the whole process of right. being in this ping pong club is about making everybody 
as happy as possible by not even thinking of winners and losers. And people aren't trying to be champions. They're trying to bring happiness to those around them. And that was so radically different a way of proceeding from the one I'd grown up with in the West. I thought it's something to learn from, uh, defining yourself in terms of a, a larger whole, whether it's a community or a company or a country. Uh, and I was thinking just actually last night, when I come back to California, I sometimes play ping pong with my English arch rival. And it's very exciting, but at a certain level, it's aggravating because <laughs> if I win, I can't sleep because I'm worried about how he's going to exact revenge. And if I lose, of course, <laughs> oh, how did I miss that you know, backhand pop spin in the fourth game? I should have got it right. and defeated. Whereas when I come back from the ping pong club in Japan every day and my wife says, how was it? I said, wonderful. And I can't tell her whether I've won or lost because I don't even know that. And of course, that's part of the principle around which East Asia as a whole, but Japan in particular, is organized and something I could never have learned in New York City, which is very much based on a <coughs> cutthroat, doggy dog kind of uh, mentality. It's so interesting that you say that um, for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, that we do also get sometimes these... Um, conflicting images out of East Asia about um, the competitiveness. Uh, I'm mean, thinking of the famous South Korean high school passing examination and sort of how that determines which university you will go to. So there's that aspect of it. But then there's also, of course, as um, in every other country in the world, but particularly in highly networked East Asia, uh, the internet has caught up uh, to such a, you know, has permeated the society to such a high degree that I'm wondering whether these these qualities of um, self-containment, um, not keeping track of things like winning and losing, uh, you know, this attitude towards life that you described exists so wonderfully in your ping pong club, whether that continues to persist in the younger generation in a country like Japan. I mean, do you see that among people who are, I don't know, half your age or a third of your age who uh, who you tend to meet? Again, such a good question. And you're absolutely right that Japan's, one of its greatest problems is what's called the hikikomori, which is the young people right. who can't even leave their room. There are more than a million of them who are completely socially self-exiled and craving any company and much too isolated, par partially, as you suggest, through the internet. And as you also say, <laughs> World War II showed that Japan, like its neighbors, is by no means innocent of predatory right. design. Um, right. Kersler, Kersler in the 1950s said it's very competitive without a sense of competition, which maybe is an attempt to, um, to get to an answer to your question, which is that Toyota and Honda and Japan as a whole are competitive and individuals are much less so because they realize they make the company succeed by effacing themselves. So really, I think of it more as a symphony orchestra in which each person plays her part perfectly and thus creates a very powerful, harmonious whole. As to how much it's changing, um, I speak as a romantic foreigner and I'm surprised how little it's changing. If you asked my Japanese wife or my Japanese neighbors, they may, like older people everywhere, say, oh, we're losing the fabric of our society. Our kids are becoming westernized. They're, they're eating on the, the subway. They're thinking of themselves. They're not looking after their elders. And I'm sure there's some of that. But I think the distinctive feature of East Asia, and India may have this in common, is thinking in terms of the long term. That, you know, the famous, maybe apocryphal story about Zhou Enlai, the Chinese leader on his deathbed <laughs> being asked, what right. do you think of the French Revolution? Oh, too early to tell, it's only 200 years ago. And I do feel that sensibility is still there in Japan. And if not in the young people, as they get older, I think they come more and more to that. I, I'm, I was very struck, as right. you know, in the book, A Beginner's Guide to Japan, I almost conclude with the wartime emperor of Japan in 1975, after 50 years on the throne, being asked, uh, how do you think Japan has changed? And he says, post-war, pre-war, I think it's pretty much the same, which is shocking to us because to most right. of the world, Japan's transformation after World War II is one of the most dramatic shifts of the 20th century. But to the Japanese, it's, it's all the same. And you know, they say in Kyoto, the water's always moving, but the river remains the same, which is, I think, a Chinese idea, essentially. But I think there's a, there's a truth to it. And that sense that Japan keeps on changing on the surface so as not to change deep down. Because anybody who gets off the plane tomorrow in Tokyo realizes it's more fashion driven and, and, and fleeting and up to the minute than anywhere. But at the level of values, 
it's remarkably slow to change. And I think it's suffering from its inability to change. So I think mm -hmm. Japan is a great outlier in the global order that hasn't got with the global problem, that doesn't speak English, that doesn't offer opportunities to women, that doesn't know how to speak the language of the world, the way even China and South Korea and certainly India right. do as right. well. So I think it's, almost, it, it's not changed enough for its own economic good. Though culturally and spiritually, that changelessness I see as an advantage, a stability yeah. maybe. And I think yeah, because I mean, I mean sorry, in go India, ahead. I, I, well, I was going to ask you, India to me, uh, when I see the shopping malls and McDonald's, whatever, constant changes at that level, but I'm wondering how much the values of India are changing. Would you say that India is similar to the Japan I've described? I think so. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, and this is a nice sort of counterplay between Japan and India, is, um, you know, Autumn Light is completely suffused with your um, amazing descriptions of just what it feels to be like, uh, be if you're part of a Japanese community. Uh, there's a family unit, but even within that, there's sort of a neighborhood unit. This includes your ping pong club. Uh, you know, there's a, so there's a real sort of sense you get of a timelessness to that unit, to the social structure. Um, and I still feel that in India quite often. I mean, I still feel, you know, maybe the jo extended joint family systems have broken down, but by and large, there's still a very thriving um, <clears throat> community level support network that people, uh, people have. Um, but but that, so your descriptions of that in Autumn Light seem to, again, the Hikikimori is one example. Um, there was a, an article in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about people who rent parents and to rent, you know, rent parental support and kind of spend time with them over the course of a day and so on. And that happens, you know, so uh, that in particular did seem to me as something that would have decisively changed um, from a Japan about 50 or 60 years, a particular kind of disintegration of the family unit or of the social structure. Um, and at the same time, clearly it also seems to coexist with what you found in Kyoto and still experience there, which is quite a thriving and robust uh, support network and, uh, and and I was wondering how you juxtapose these two contradictions. Yes, uh, and as you say, for example, the rate of divorce has exploded in the 30 years that I've been in Japan. I don't think the situation of women has improved, but women right. wish to assert their restlessness and sometimes to claim a foreign identity or destiny by joining a foreign company, marrying a foreigner, living abroad. That has changed. I think women in Japan acknowledge that Japan is slow, so slow to change. They have to change their circumstances by defecting from Japan, as it were, and even right. many of them moving to India and Nepal, for example. <laughs> so uh, the global world has given opportunities for the individual to secede from the system in Japan, partly because Japan itself is um, so slow to change. I was noticing recently the University of Toronto conducted quite an extensive survey on 45 developed countries to see how traditional or untraditional they were. And the most traditional, for better or worse, was Japan, still. Right, you, right. When you mentioned that New Yorker piece about people renting um, uh, parents or children, um, and the most striking example for me is an elderly couple whose daughter maybe has moved to uh, Bodhgaya or California to get away from Japan. So they don't have right. a daughter to come and, and look in on them every Sunday, will literally seek out an agency and have an actress come visit them every Sunday and say, hello, mom, hello, dad, how have you been? Let's have a wonderful Sunday afternoon together. And to us, it, it stands very strange. To them, it's a suspension of disbelief of a kind to fill that hole in their hearts and to deal with the fact that in Japan, people, grown women, aren't looking after their parents the way they used to. But that very phenomenon, that suspension of reality, I think is a very Japanese thing that hasn't changed. And I think the Japanese, like their Chinese and Korean neighbors, have this pragmatic notion, well, you don't actually have to go across the world to see the Eiffel Tower. Seeing a replica of the Eiffel Tower is just as good and can awaken the same sensation of, of wonder and surprise and beauty, which again to us often sounds strange, but is something that they um, are much more ready to do. The, the central spiritual structure in Japan, the main shrine at Ise, the main Shinto shrine, is rebuilt every 20 years. So it will always be at exactly the same stage of oldness and, and newness. So again, that's right. shocking. I can't imagine Notre Dame being reconstructed <coughs> in 20 years. But the Japanese right. are prepared to do that because I would say maybe they're less interested in surfaces than in the values that those surfaces 
create um, or, or transmit. So again, socially, many changes, many young women not even marrying at all there. But I think those social changes also reflect how slow the whole is to change. I mean, it's shocking at this point of the 30 countries in Asia, in terms of English language proficiency, Japan uh, is 29th, only ahead of Laos, even though it's probably the most affluent, developed and sophisticated culture. And that speaks for a slowness to engage with the rest of the world and a slowness to be other than Japanese, which I sort of understand on the social level, because Japan has functioned so well on its own terms, so seamlessly and efficiently, they think if it ain't broke, why fix it? Um, They're quite happy with the way Japan is is proceeding on its own terms, though globally, of course, they're ever further from the the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, because it it strikes me that when you move to Japan, actually, that's not the kind of image that people had about Japan at all. That was supposed to be the era of rising Japan, You know, you had books like Rising Sun by Michael Crichton that made so much of um, Japan's uh, adventurousness overseas, whether industrial or capitalistic. Um, But all of that seems to have sort of ebbed a little bit uh, over the last 25 or 30 years, coincidentally, just as uh, the time that you've been there. Uh, Ebbed dramatically, just 25 years of recession, essentially. And Japan showed in the post-war years that was strikingly able to remake itself to to in, the, in an American model to copy America and to do America better than America did, but unable to take the lead and unable to take the initiative and become truly um, a, a global leader. China probably will do that, but Japan wasn't up, up to that challenge and, and having made Japan as perfect as it could be, couldn't go to the next step. So yes, as, right. as you say, one of the curiosities of my life is to be part of dying empires. I was born and grew up in England just in its post-imperial miasma when the empire was gone and nothing had come along to replace it. I moved to America at pretty much the time I think the American empire began to unravel. In my first book in 1985, I said, well, the American empire has gone now and, and the empire belongs to Asia. And then I moved to Japan, as you perfectly point out, just at the moment the Japanese boom and bubble exploded in Japan. So any country that sees me on its way to to its borders probably has good reason to shiver and wonder what affliction I'm going to bring to it. uh, (laughs) Uh, My my conviction in this is that you moved to Japan and Japan took one look at you and realized the value of self-containment and (laughs) solitude and inwardness and decided to practice exactly what you were looking for. So um, (laughs) very generous. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, Um, I've been to North Korea a couple of times, so I realized self-containment on a national level has severe disadvantages. Right. Sorry, I I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Um, You have, uh, we want to, I I want to talk a little bit more about these two fabulous new books, which I um, encourage everybody to buy and read, Um, Autumn Light uh, and A Beginner's Guide to Japan. And I want to ask you, What might perhaps be the more obvious question, um, why two books at a time when most of us can barely write one? How did that come about? Yes, I mean, a very perverse thing because I wrote these two contradictory books at the same time uh, for the same publisher to come out at the same time. And it's partly because, as we've been saying, I think Japan is a nest of contradictions and almost explodes that sense of either or that we're very attached to in the West. I think it's a non-binary culture. And you know, famously, if you're in Japan in the last week of every year, on December 24th, you see people flocking into Christian churches to listen to Bach and Beethoven. And one week later, you see them all going to the Buddhist temple to hear a bronze bell being struck 108 times to mark the purging of the sins of the year. And a few hours after that, you see them at the Shinto shrine, <clears throat> setting an auspicious tone for the new year. And to our more dualistic thinking. You think, wait a minute, how can you sincerely go to a Christian church, a Shinto shrine and a Buddhist temple in the same eight days? And the Japanese would say each of them serves a different function. It's not as if it's an either or, but it's just the way that we will consult a brother, a sister and a father in the same week. Mm -hmm. And and we're not contradicting each other, but we're speaking to different selves. Um, It's also because I think all of us know that if you care deeply about a place or a person, Um, your feelings are very contradictory. What you think of at eight in the morning is very different from what you may say at three in the afternoon, and that in turn changes. And 
I think most of all, I was trying to do justice to the fact I'm both inside Japan and always will be outside. So exactly as you so perfectly said, the book Autumn Light is an attempt to allow a Japanese community or neighborhood to speak to you almost unmediated without my intercession so that you, the reader, feels what it is to live in a typical suburban neighborhood. And the other book, A Beginner's Guide to Japan, is much more the outsider speaking back to Japan and what many a person might feel if she arrived in Narita Airport outside Tokyo tomorrow and noticed all the ways that it's very, very different from any culture in the world. And I think mm -hmm. what we see out when we're looking for a home or looking for a partner is this mix of the foreign and the familiar. We want something familiar, which I felt that first day in Narita to, to steady us emotionally and to comfort us and to give us a sense of continuity. And we want something foreign to be stimulated by. And so the mind is always noticing everything that's different and the heart is responding to something that's the same. And I wanted um, to do justice to that by two <laughs> uh, books that contradict each other. Um, and also I wanted to make it easier for the reader. So the reader who wants to give herself over to a single narrative that's a little like a Japanese movie from the 1950s where nothing seems to be happening could read Autumn Light. And a person who wants a, a torrent of tweets or haiku about Japan <laughs> and have her mind shaken up can turn to the other book. And then the, the perverse kind of reader, as generous as you, can read both of them and try to put these two incompatibles into the same sentence. I love how your your only concession to social media is to write a book in the form of social media <laughs> messaging, which is fantastic. <laughs> well, um, actually, that speaks to, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Uh, sure. It speaks to, and it will come out of what I say now, it speaks to the sense that I feel as a writer who's been doing this for, as you said, a long time now, that readers' attention spans are radically changing and diminishing. Uh, in our accelerated culture. And so I deliberately also was writing one book um, with very long sentences and no resolutions to try to stretch the reader and engage her in a very intimate conversation and remind her of a kind of lockdown sensibility, what it is to really engage with somebody for three hours on end. And in the other book, I was playing to the fact that people think in tweets now and don't have um, the attention to listen to something for more than 15 seconds. So one was going against the modern attention span and one was playing to it. And I wonder for you as a writer, are you conscious of the fact that even a book is a hard sell these days? And it's a challenge to a reader because she wants a four minute article or what she can get in a tweet or a nine minute TED talk. Um, and writers have to adapt to that probably. I mean, it's interesting you say that because when I think when Twitter and all these other forms of social media came out, there was this abiding fear that they would just completely erode and eat away at the whatever remnant of attention span that we all of us had. Um, and, uh, and I think long form journalism, narrative journalism of the kind that we both do in various ways, um, everybody thought that would be the first casualty of something like this, because who would want to read uh, an article for 20 minutes or 25 minutes? But it seems to me that actually the, the real casualty has been sort of the in-between length, the 700 to 800 word article that you can convince yourself has been summarized quite accurately in two or three <laughs> tweets. You might be wrong, but you can still convince yourself of that. Yeah. Whereas I think there's still a notion that um, if you write a piece of about over 8,000 words, uh, that you're doing something that is fundamentally different um, from the act of con composing a tweet. There's some, there's a different quality in there that you are getting as a reader. And, uh, and so as a result of that, I think that particular form tends to, tends to flourish. Uh, at least that's what I found over the last two or three years. There's even more hunger for it. The publications that do this kind of thing are doing quite well. Uh, the book form, uh, Pico, I'm sorry to say, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the future holds for people who continue to write nonfiction, uh, because I think that is really the form uh, that is hit the most. Because a book is a product that you have to go out and buy. It's not something that uh, emerges on your social media feed that you can just click on. Uh, the act of being proactive about a book means that uh, you have to have read about it and you have to somehow in your mind uh, conduct this act of triage where you um, understand which books are more important to read in a particular moment and which aren't. And uh, and invariably more and more, I think the kind of books that make it past 
that barrier and make it into the uh, the attentions of the emergency room, so to speak. Um, I think are the books that tend to speak very much to this particular moment. There will be uh, a book about the tech industry, which is, um, again, very much of the moment. There will be multiple books on Donald Trump and his presidency. Um, so it, it becomes an extension of newspaper journalism that is put out, that is compiled and put out quite rapidly. Uh, I think those are the books that tend to do well. I think um, books that aren't, you know, this is, it's very funny because when you write a nonfiction book, uh, you're often asked to write an op-ed or a, or a pitch note or something like that uh, in which you explain why this matters now. And I, I find myself sort of thinking every time that it's such an artificial way of looking at it because you don't necessarily always want to read something that matters in the here and now. You want to read something that will uh, give you enough to subsist on as you move through the next few weeks and months without being directly related to these events. Um, so I think that quality, I think, is really uh, dripped down into the publishing world uh, to an alarming degree, I think. Such a powerful answer. And you really gave me hope with what you said about um, long-form journalism. Though it's interesting also in the context of this uh, virus moment that I feel one thing it's highlighted is some maybe forgotten longing for intimacy and even right. attention. Of course, famously, people have been <laughs> reading Tolstoy and Proust or picking up books that they'd forgotten about in the last three or four months. And so my hope, obviously it's a selfish hope, is that there's still something in us that's longing for that. But as you, I think, suggest, maybe that would express itself more in fictional form, that there'll always be the hunger for stories. But right. nonfiction is a much harder sell. And what you just said is exactly what my friends in New York say to me. If you're writing nonfiction, if it's not about Donald Trump, nobody's going to read it, um, which is a right. huge loss, but it's a fact of life. Um, right. Which reminds me that I wanted to ask you a question at the beginning of this, since we talked about reading during the pandemic. What have you been reading over the last um, few months? Uh, I finally did complete Proust after 19 years. Um, Congratulations. And, just, thank you. and now I'm actually going back to volume one and starting all over. And Japan anyways, for me, because I don't speak much of language, it's a very calm place to read and I spend one hour on our little terrace every day in the sun reading um, either a novel or a work of serious nonfiction. Um, like many of us I have to do a lot of reading for uh, homework because I have an on-stage series of conversations here in Santa Barbara which I often talk to writers so I'm currently reading all the books of the writers I'm about to talk to uh, but I still find every day when I come in from my terrace after my hours reading. I feel myself more attentive, more nuanced, deeper, much better part of myself than anything else the rest of the day. And it reminds me how reading fulfills a gap that for me nothing else quite fulfills. And this is reading of a substantial book, um, a right. uh, 250 page. It takes me into some part of myself that's forgotten and that I'm the weaker to live without. Um, so for me, there's no substitute for that kind of reading. But of course, I speak as a writer and not a typical human human being. But um, I, I remember V.S. Naipaul saying that a long time ago, that films had become the narrative form of our moment. Uh, but right, reading is a training in inwardness and self-containment and some of the things that you've been talking about, for which I'm not sure there's a substitute. Uh, and I find that as a, as a person... I would much rather a three-hour conversation than 63-minute conversations right. uh, or even three one-hour conversations. And I think a book still can satisfy that longing for attention, which I think is a, where happiness lies. I am most happy when I forget the time, I lose all track of who or where I am, and I'm deep in a conversation, either with a person or actually with a book. Right, right. But that's, that's lovely. I mean, I, yeah, old fashioned way of seeing things. It's lovely, and I think we should put uh, I speak as a writer, not as a typical human being, on t shirts and wear it just to <laughs> signify the tribe that we belong to. It's a perfect slogan. Um, <laughs> uh, coming back to Autumn Light, uh, Japan has now yeah. been your adopted home for 30 plus years. Uh, yes. And you've had various adopted homes. I mean, you're of Indian extraction, you uh, grew up in England. 
you uh, lived in California, you lived in New York. Uh, and um, not to sort of hark back uh, too strongly to your TED Talk and, and other things that you've written, but uh, you know, this idea of home, I'm really thoroughly intrigued by the fact uh, that you as a writer who is so alive all the time to the nuances of language, who thinks about language almost 24 seven, you found a home in a place where you don't actually speak the language uh, as, as well as you did in, <clears throat> in England or California or New York. Mm. How does that disconnect work? How is it that as a writer to not, um, to not be alive to the spoken and written word of the country that you consider home, uh, how do you adjust to still considering it home? Well, I went to Japan to learn silence because that's exactly, as you say, what I hadn't learned enough of um, in England or California or New York. And I feel that our deepest communication usually comes when no words are involved. And Japan is very much predicated on, on that model. Um, when we talk about economy in Japan, they're very economical with words and very economical with expressions. And when it's an extremely hot day, everybody will come into my neighborhood uh, post office and say, Atsui, desne, isn't it hot? Exactly the same words in exactly the same intonation. And as you say, that's very different from what you would hear in New York, where each person would have a beautifully original embroidered way of saying it's hot enough to fry a <laughs> raccoon on or whatever. Um, but I was fascinated by that, that the Japanese are very good at reading body language. And most of all, most comfortable in the realm of what is not said. And I feel that I've been using the word intimacy a lot, but the definition of friend is not necessarily somebody you can say everything to, but somebody you don't have to say anything to, somebody with whom you can sit in silence. And I'm sure that's how many of us are with our partners or in our most meaningful moments when we're in prayer, in love, in terror, um, we lose all words. And I've always been interested in that. And I, since for 29 years now, I've been going to a silent Benedictine uh, hermitage here in California and rejoicing in the liberation from words. And I think to some extent, your question is such a good one, but having spent 38 years full time with words, I distrust many words. And I'm always looking for what lies on the far side of words. So yes, um, it's, it's a deprivation to be in a country where I can't follow what is being said. At the same time, I feel it's sometimes been likened to watching a foreign movie without the subtitles. And by not following the words, you're attending to other things. And I'm glad to be trained in looking for visual and <coughs> nonverbal clues. Um, and also I noticed, for example, my Japanese wife, whom I've known 32 years, her English is fairly imperfect. But when she comes to England or the US, she notices things about them I would never notice. Mm -hmm. And so be precisely because she's liberated from words in some ways. Um, so it's a perverse thing to do. But I don't feel that Japan has robbed me of words. It's but it has tutored me in the virtue of, of all that can be done without words. Um, and I, I find I don't miss the words. You're absolutely right in suggesting I will go weeks on end really without speaking English in Japan. Right. And I don't speak much Japanese. And uh, it's that principle, you know, Japan is the land of subtraction rather than addition. And, and I'm very Indian and always will be. And I think of India as the maximalist multiplication, play, you know, every street, every thought, every temple is very, very crowded. And Japan is exactly the opposite. And you go into a traditional tatami room and there's nothing there except a scroll and a vase. And because there's nothing there, but those two things, you bring all your attention to them and you find everything you could want and much more just in that scroll or that vase. And so almost living without words is, is the same process for me. It teaches me attention and it trains me to find as much as possible out of every word. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it's not what everybody would do, but uh, in, these, in the case of these two books, as you saw, they're both very short and I worked for 16 years on each of them. And in each of them, as you also suggested, I was working with 32 years of experiences and, amount to, and emotions and encounters. And part of the interest of that was trying to keep out as much as possible. And you as a writer, you know, one of the things I love about this divided island is 
the, the sense of space between the sections, the silences within. It's a very, it's written with great restraint and understatement, I feel, and that's what gives it a lot of its power. Um, it's not a wordy book. And in these two books, I was trying to make the silence between the sentences and, and sections speak as much as the sentences themselves, partly because, as you know, the book Autumn Light is about absence. And it's a, it begins with the death of my father-in-law. And it's about that sensation we all know, whereby when you lose somebody through a death or through a breakup, that person is more present and more around you and more inside you when when she was alive or when she was part of your life. And that absence is more potent than presence. Often silence is more eloquent than words. And that sensation that we all know when you go into a loved one's room when she's not there and you see the postcard that she's pasted up on the wall and you read the, or you look at the diary that she has on her dresser and you see her clothes. In some ways you see her inwardly in all her longings and her vulnerabilities and her hopes more than you would if she was standing right in front of you. So in these two books, having written very wordy books in the past, I wanted to sort of investigate how to make, make absence live on the page and how to feel, help the reader to feel everything that wasn't being said, which is often the most substantial part of our lives. And anyone who's in a marriage, and my book is partly about 32 years of being with the same person, knows that you live in, in the realm where words can't touch. Um, and so in both these books, by trying to keep things out, I was trying to force myself to go to those, those places and to awaken in the reader that recognition that uh, it's in the unsaid that we're really inhabiting most profoundly. I mean, I love this reference you, um, you had to the scroll of the vase that you just mentioned, just sort of one object that by itself can just communicate so much. Uh, and it reminded me of, of one of the many lines that I've written down from your um, from a beginner's guide to Japan. Uh, Perfection is part of what makes Japan so wonderfully welcoming foreigners. Um, but deep down, of course, it's unyieldingly hospitable to people who live there, who are from there. And I was wondering if, uh, I mean, I hate to sort of ask you to expand on what is clearly just a beautiful aphoristic line, but I was wondering if there was something that something more that you could tell us about these two levels at which Japan operates to foreigners and to, uh, to the people who are from there or who live there, and what makes it, as you said, unyieldingly hospitable, inhospitable? Well, I love the fact you mentioned two levels, and that's exactly why I wrote two books to speak for those two levels. And in one book, I'm almost like a quasi-Japanese in autumn light, and in the other, right. I'm very much a foreigner um, in the beginner's guide. Uh, so yes, I would never want to be Japanese. Left to my own devices, I would want to spend every hour of every day of my life in Japan. And I think as a foreigner, one's living in an unusually privileged position, able to enjoy the graces and, and beauty and selflessness of the culture without paying the taxes, as it were, and without being subject to the intense pressures to, to perform impeccably, which all Japanese are. And when first I met my wife, my third week in Japan in 1987, I was drawn to Japan, which to me, as I said before, was this old, deep, wise place. And she, with equal justification, was drawn to the outside world and everything that wasn't Japan and spoke for liberation and possibility and the chance not to be hemmed in by tradition. And I think that's one of the things I represented to her, that we were moving in opposite directions, projecting our longings on the other's culture. So I absolutely understand why many a Japanese person, especially a woman, wants to get away from Japan. And so uh, perfection is a wonderful thing to enjoy as an observer. And it's a frightful thing to um, have to carry as somebody expected to be impeccable in her every act and deed. And it's more than any human is up to really. I remember the first time I wrote about Japan 35 years ago in my first book, Video Night in Kathmandu, I titled that chapter Perfect Strangers. And I was referring to the way in which the Japanese are perfect hosts to this day. Um, that we as visitors are, will always be perfect strangers. And I suppose the third part of it is that for the Japanese person living in this uh, very, very uh, clean and um, in some ways dogmatic society, um, <clears throat> they're told to be perfect in every way. And that's, that's an impossible request, really. Yeah, um, yeah. So that begins to get at some of what was lying in that sentence, I think. Yeah. 
I mean, it's so interesting because when I um, when I grew up reading you, I mean, I would read um, a lot of the essays that, I mean, your travel work, of course, but then I really did think that you were the bard of what I might call the liminal space, you know, and, and your work on airports is a classic example. I mean, just these things that are neither inside nor outside, where you're never a local or a foreigner. Um, and uh, it, it, it only strikes me now hearing you talk about Japan is that you have somehow constructed for yourself a fairly liminal space within Japan where you're neither in nor out. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's something about the, the liminality of these spaces, whether it's an airport or whether it's your position in, in Japan, that, uh, that is liberating in some way, that kind of frees you up to, uh, to explore or to regress or to be the kind of person you want to be that you won't get otherwise in the, in the two extremes, the inside and the outside. Gosh, nobody asks me questions as thoughtful as this, nor reads my work <laughs> as searchingly as you. I, I thank you. I love that part of the liminal space. And you're, you're absolutely right. I think many people would say, with justification, well, it's interesting that I've chosen to make a home in the most foreign, science fictive place around. For example, here in the United States, I'm warmly welcomed, and everyone is more than happy to see me as an American. And I could, though I will never be. American. And I think one of the things I discovered, maybe even in Narita that first day, is where you feel at home and where you belong are not necessarily the same thing. And I feel absolutely at home in Japan, though I'll never belong there. Uh, and I'm more than warmly welcomed in America, but I'll never be an American, though I've been officially resident for more than 50 years. But yes, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable being an outsider, living on the margins, being a foreigner, because that's what I'm used to. And even as a little boy growing up in England, I would never look like the people around me in England, which is a very all white culture in the 1960s. I would always feel something of a foreigner, even going back to India, because I don't speak any of the Indian languages and I've never lived in India. I'll always fully be a foreigner here in the United States. And so being a foreigner is my second home. It's a natural state for me. And, and therefore I'm not disturbed or affronted to be a foreigner in Japan. And you're probably, you put your finger on something essential, I think, that uh, I'm happy to be in a place that to some degree I'll always be excluded from. And you talked about wonderfully not being an insider or an outsider. And because Japan is not an either or culture in these books, I've done the kind of both and. So I've written one book fully as if I'm an insider and one book fully as if I'm an outsider to speak for those two things that, as you say, are always simultaneously um, inside me. But I think one of the things I appreciate about Japan, curiously, is that, as you say, the lines are very sharply drawn there between who's inside and who's outside. And so I live there on a tourist visa to keep myself honest and to remind myself if I lived here for the rest of my life, I'll still be outside. Because America, as you know, blurs those distinctions. And that's the promise of America, that people can arrive from anywhere and become, so to speak, an American very quickly. People arrive from everywhere in Japan and they will never be Japanese. And there's a clarity and, and a freedom, as you say, that comes from, from that fact. But I will have to think more about the question because it's a deep one and why I'm um, comfortable in the liminal space. But I'm sure you're right that I am. And the liminal space was a very unusual one. When I was a little boy, I thought, my goodness, what a rare privilege it is to have Indian blood and an Indian face and an Indian name, but an English upbringing and an English voice and an English education and an American residence, residence in the land of opportunity. Um, and those days I thought very few kids were given three sets of eyes and three ways of looking at the world. And now, of course, it's very much the norm. I think of it as the signature quality of the 21st century that certainly in, in Bangalore, but even more in London, Sydney, Vancouver, if you go into a classroom, most of those kids have parts of themselves in four cultures or five cultures, many more than mm -hmm. I. And I think it's become almost the default mechanism of the 21st century. And a great liberation. I mean, we've seen a huge rise in nationalism and tribalism in the last few years. But a part of me thinks nationalism is on the rise because it's on the run and because it's threatened by the fact that borders are willy-nilly dissolving 
on an individual basis, that every time somebody from Bangalore meets and falls in love with uh, a woman from France and, and creates a child who's partly Bangalorean, partly French, and partly probably something else, it becomes harder and harder to think in terms of black and white or either or, or East and West, in fact. So I think slowly but surely, um, those old categories are becoming redundant. Um, and I was lucky to be in the early stages of that process whereby one couldn't even think of oneself as inside and outside. And everybody is, as you said, transfixed by Donald Trump right now because he represents the, the last gasp, I'm hoping, of the old mode. But I am fascinated by President Obama, who I think could see the world in a global way as no American president could precisely because he was neither black nor white, because he was raised in Honolulu and in Indonesia, because he had Kenya and Kansas inside of him. And that meant that nobody knew where he was coming from. And perhaps he didn't even know where he was coming from in any sentence. But I thought it also meant the possibility of a great liberation from those old, uh, very divisive categories. Um, so I'm very happy if I can't be placed in any category and can't, can't be imprisoned in, is this guy from the East or the West? Um, is he an insider right. or outsider? Right. You, because I mean, you, you, must you, you, read, you read, sorry? That you must feel some of the same as an Indian who's working for American newspapers while living in Cambridge. And do you feel that? I, I do. I mean, it's a, it's a funny, um, there's a little story, which is basically when we moved from, New York to England last year, I flew by myself because my wife had flown here first and I was, I landed and I took a train from uh, the airport, there's a train directly to Cambridge and it sort of uh, goes through London, it stops at Blackfriars and maybe a couple of other um, stations near the river and uh, you know it goes over the bridge and you can kind of look out and you can see the Thames uh, spread out uh, past the window. And I remember I was reading a book and uh, when when we when we passed the river, I barely even looked up to look out, and it struck me much later how unnatural that was. I mean, I was moving to a new country, a new continent, a place I hadn't lived as an adult at all. Um, I'd been to London many times, of course, and you know, so I'd seen the river before, but it struck me as um, somehow as if I'd lost the sense of wonder that comes with being what Theresa May. Uh, witheringly called a citizen of everywhere, which is that you don't really, you tend to take these things for granted. You don't look out of the window and look at this mighty river that has fed one of the world's great metropolises. <laughs> and um, in that moment, and in that moment alone, I felt somewhat as if I was the poorer for it. And I felt as if, if, if this was my first time ever venturing out of my home country, I would have taken everything in with a lot more greed and wonder and um, and joy, maybe even. And I wonder if, and I, I wonder if you feel that sometimes as well. I really love that. And that moment is going to stay with me because, because you're right, we do take that kind of thing for granted. And what you're really describing is the whole world is your home. You truly grew up as a global enough person. Uh, and then on the other hand, I think of my parents who grew up in British India in Bombay in the 1930s and 1940s. And for them, Actually, when they moved to England as students, England seemed like a suburb of India, you know, because Britain right. and India's destinies were so intertwined that the natural extension of studying in Bombay for them, relatively fortunate people, was then to go and study further in England. But mm -hmm. of course, they wouldn't have felt at home in America. It was just Britain and India and I suppose other parts of the empire that would have felt like part of their <coughs> global nation. Um, you're absolutely right. I, of course, am a sort of glass of water half full person. And so I think the virtue of being a foreigner everywhere is that everywhere is interesting. And that even when I go to England or India or California, because I don't fully belong there, my eyes are open to it. But there's no challenging what you said. To some extent, we, our eyes are closed to places and that we take for granted what should be as you said wonderfully, um, an experience of, of wonder and discovery. My sense is that the longer you will stay in England, the more inevitably you'll start to be thinking about all the ways in which it's not the United States or mm -hmm. India and slowly will be reminded of its foreignness. And again, Naipaul wonderfully in that book, The Enigma of Arrival is writing about the England where he's lived for 30 years, recognizing how it will not only be foreign, but always different from the place he dreamed of or read about. 
a very haunting book because it's about, I suppose, that sense that even the countries in which we live can never be entirely our own and never what we want them to be, which is a good thing because it means that the longer you're in England, um, the more you'll realize, actually, it's not my home and uh, it's not giving me everything I would ask of a home. And maybe that's a good thing. So on the, on the train ride in, you would feel very, very comfortable. But as the years go on, this is a perverse thing to wish upon you, but the <laughs> dissatisfaction and you realize actually I'm not finding what I need in England. Right, um, right. When I, if I were to fly to England tomorrow and take that same train ride, I would feel, my goodness, this is second nature to me. This is that place I grew up in. This is as boring to me as my backyard. But at, at, in time, I will also feel the dissatisfaction with it. And I'm glad about that almost. Right. Because, I mean, obviously these questions of insider, outsider, these questions of what is home, what isn't, who is at home, where, uh, these have political connotations, which you did talk about, but they also have very literary connotations. And the genre that you and I um, have both inhabited, you far more than me, which is the genre of travel writing, uh, which again devolves around this question of what it is like to feel in a place that you're visiting for the first time or maybe the second time or the nth time, and how do you write about it? Uh, and, and so what happens, I, I guess, what is the best kind of travel writing to do at a point where you, like many of your readers, will possibly have been to the places uh, you're writing about more than once? Um, when your readers are as well-traveled as you are, which certainly wasn't the case in the 19th century and the early 20th century, what then happens to the act of travel writing and how do you negotiate uh, this new era that we're in? It's such a rich question. And I really feel the only travel writing that's interesting is what would never necessarily be categorized as travel writing because the travel part is the least important aspect. And what makes a piece of travel writing is the personal question and, and the personal uncertainty perhaps that anybody is bringing to that writing. I think you know, one of the great works of travel writing in my lifetime is The Snow Leopard by Peter right. Matheson. So he's traveling to a part of Nepal that almost no Westerner had ever seen before. But what really gives that book enduring beauty and poignancy is he's traveling into parts of himself that he might not have investigated. <clears throat> he's just lost his young wife, Deborah Love, to cancer. So he's really traveling into grief and uncertainty and anger and trying to process a loss that he can never come to terms with. And what gives that book its, its pull is not the foreign destination, but the very, very familiar emotional landscape that he is trying to navigate. And he's reaching out to the Buddhism around him to try to come find an answer for the emptiness he feels within. How do you deal with impermanence, essentially, is what that book is about. And Nepal and the Himalayan mountains and the Buddhist monasteries he visits are just a means to engaging with this very universal question. And we, I was just mentioning B.S. Naipaul, what makes his writing about England piercing is not that he's writing about England, but he's writing about estrangement and he's writing about loneliness and he's writing about the fact that he will never be at home, maybe anywhere in the world. And it's, it speaks to the beginning of your question. I was, when you were talking, I was suddenly thinking about your book that I keep rereading about Sri Lanka, this divided island. And every time I read it, Part of the power of that comes for me from the fact that I think you're of Tamil ancestry, as am I, and you're visiting this place where the Tamils are at war with the Sinhala, but you're not exactly a Sri Lankan Tamil. Um, and you're coming to it from this very interesting angle in which, like me, to some extent you invested because South Indians are at the heart of the Sri Lankan life and political landscape. But on the other, you have very little in common with the Tamils who've grown up in Sri Lanka for um, many, many generations. And, and so there's, it's a very personal quest, I think, for you, having to do with how two different cultures live in the same place and are actually at violent odds. But I think the fact you're from Tamil ancestry brings something to it that somebody even from another part of India wouldn't have. Um, and again, it, it doesn't, it's never the explicit subject of, of the piece, 
but it, it's animating and driving your questions and your restlessness and your need to go back to Sri Lanka again and again um, in a way that a writer from California or London is unlikely to, mm-hmm. to bring it the same way. So I think all of us in our travels, if they really stir us, it's because a foreign destination is helping us sort through uh, a subject deeply close to home in us. And I think even um, when I went to Japan the first time, at that time, my, one of my favorite books was Narcissus and Goldman by Herman Hesse, which is about two peop- people who grew up very closely. One becomes a monk <clears throat> and one becomes an artist and an adventurer traveling around the world. <clears throat> and I think even when I read that book at the age of 15, I probably felt there are parts of each of these characters inside me. And when I went to Japan, it was a way hence my title, The Lady and the Monk, of exploring more deeply and trying to clarify to myself this very personal inner question I had inside myself. So I think travel writing is only as interesting as the questions it generates. And those questions usually don't have entirely to do with the destination, but much more with what that individual is bringing to the destination. So if I'm writing about Japan and most of my readers are familiar (laughs) with sushi and manga and Haruki Murakami novels, no problem because it's my dialogue. (laughs) It's my dialogue with this place that inexplicably fascinates me. And it's as unique as any conversation is in exactly the same way as when you write about Sri Lanka, you're writing about it in a way that very, very few people can because you're bringing a lot to it and you're bringing, your, apart from anything, your knowledge of South Indian culture, your familiarity with the Tamil language and your interest in this situation in which Tamils are vividly implicated, as it were. So I'm not worried about the future of travel writing because I think travel writing is just a, a genre category for what is really about the dialogue each one of us is having with the environment around us and we're drawn to certain places because they ask us questions that are close to the deepest questions inside us. Um, And I'm glad actually in the course of my life, as you suggest for 35 years of writing about foreign places, when I began in the 1980s and I would write about Cuba or Tibet, my assumption was I was bringing the sensory details of those places to readers and friends and neighbors who would never get the chance to go to Cuba or Tibet. Now in the year 2020, anybody who reads uh, Samanth or Pico can access on YouTube parts of Sri Lanka or Cuba or Tibet that I would never be able to see in real life. So it, you don't have, it dispenses with the, the visual sensory stuff. And when I'm writing about Cuba or Tibet, I have to write at some very deep sort of existential level. Uh, and I can't be content with just describing what the places look and sound like because visual media can capture that much better than I can do in prose. So I think travel writing, all writing now has to be much more personal, much more inward, and has to claim those spaces that no camera or tape recorder can bring home more vividly, which are spaces of nuance, of of silence, of hesitation. Um, So in these books that I wrote about Japan, implicitly (coughs) saying anyone who reads me can access extraordinary things about Japan with the flip of a switch um, on her iPhone. So what am I going to... say about Japan and how am I going to engage with Japan in a way that she can't get better on screen. So it's a different way of coming at the uh, attention span question that you and I were discussing a few minutes ago. What does writing have to offer that nothing else can? And every writer has to answer that to justify the books he brings into the world at this point. Right. Because I think sort of one of the unique and glorious sort of contradictions of your career always has been Pico Ayer, the travel writer, who emphasizes the value of staying still. And yes. uh, I think uh, with these books, with Autumn Light in particular, I feel Autumn Light is, um, you know, there's, there's yet another sort of unique and glorious contradiction embodied in it, which is it's a travel book about home, uh, about your home in particular. It's not something that you're experiencing for the first time. You've been there for 30 years. And it's not necessarily even a book that's written to tell other people how to get there and what to do there. Um, but it still has very much of the questing quality that is found in the best travel books. Um, This this urge to know a society better and to kind of communicate its intricacies in a way that goes beyond just 
as you say, the sensory uh, or the visual or the, uh, or the tactile. And I think all of that brought together is uh, you've really written a travel book about, uh, well, it's many things, but it's also a travel book about, uh, about your home and your community. Yes, and about finding a home in a foreign place. And, and I love that word questing you use, because I would say what that book really is about is how do we make our peace with death? And how do we make our peace with uncertainty? And how do we make our peace with, uh, mortal, uh, with, um, with foreignness, I suppose, and, and solitude too? But it begins with a death. And it's about trying to make sense of the fact all of us are getting older and nothing remains the same. Uh, and because the fact that nothing lasts means that everything matters. But, um, and like Peter Matheson in Nepal, I choose to go to Japan where impermanence is almost the religion and the creed of the culture to figure out how to navigate my older years, the autumn of my life, the fact that I will see slowly the people I care about and the places I care about change and, and, and disappear from the face of the earth. Uh, so travel book about being at home. And as you say, at many parts in the book, I am observing Japan with a foreigner's uh, intrigued, bewildered eyes, but also a means to exactly a quest into the questions that absorb me in the second half of life, um, which is how do we find our joy right now? And how can a book about impermanence and death not be a sad book, but in fact be a book about a joyful participation in a world of sorrows, as is sometimes said? Um, and how can a book that begins with death and is obviously moving towards death be a book about opening our eyes to all the beauties around, which is, I think, just what you were saying um, some time ago. And I'm, I'm aware that we've, we've gone over one, our, our one hour limit, but I think we're having such a rich and fun conversation. <laughs> I'm happy to keep going as long as we, we can keep talking. I mean, we should, uh, we should let these other guys go, but I do have sort of one question that might wrap things up nicely. Um, and it's sort of, again, to circle back to this particular very unique um, a quite troubling time that we're in. I mean, we're seeing, I live in the UK, where there's been more than 40,000 sort of deaths, uh, perhaps even more than 60,000 in the US, we're seeing upwards of 100,000. Uh, and I think everywhere around the world, I think people could, uh, could benefit from knowing from you a little more about how the Japanese do treat this question of death and impermanence. I mean, what is the, what is the solace or the comfort they can take from what is otherwise an extremely traumatic, distressing experience? So I'd say that the Japanese, with their deeply Buddhist roots, don't see suffering as an aberration or an insult. It's nothing personal. And suffering is a fact of life. And suffering is the frame of life within which we have to make our, our joy and our lives and within which we have to find our hope and our beauty. And by very marked contrast with the young United States and especially the California where I'm sitting right now, which is the land of endless summer and where suffering is a shock. And because of the pursuit of happiness, I feel that many of the, my friends and neighbors here were encouraged to believe that life was a privilege and opportunity and that challenge is not the way it's meant to be. In Japan, expectations are pitched very differently. People grow up in a world where there are 2,000 earthquakes every year, there are 20 typhoons that sweep through every year, and there's a the backdrop of 1,400 year history of earthquake, forest fire, warfare, and tsunami. So they expect suffering to be the nature of things. Like the Buddha, they know every birth ends in a death, every meeting ends in a separation, nothing lasts forever. And if suffering is what you expect, you're pleasantly surprised by its absence or its release or the ways in which the Buddha taught us um, how we respond to suffering um, in the mind. And, uh, you know, what that, as Shakespeare put it, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. That, and I remember many years ago in the hills of California, I lost my house and every last thing, including my wishes to become a writer, all of it went up into flames and was reduced to ash. And what I learned in the months after that was the seeming catastrophe was in many ways a liberation. 
And once I'd adjusted to the fact that I had nothing in the world but a toothbrush, of course, it brought home what you and I have been talking about, that home is internal. It's not where you live. It's what lives inside you. But beyond that, when the insurance company came along and said, we'll replace all your possessions, I realized I didn't need 90% of the books and the clothes and the furniture I'd accumulated. I could live much more lightly on the earth. And I noticed that the book I'd been working on, my next three books were all reduced to ash, but I still wanted to write. And I thought now I will try fiction, which I would have been too shy or scared to attempt previously. And having lost my physical home in California, it became much easier for me to spend more and more time um, in the home of my heart, as I've been describing, Japan. So I was painfully aware, as during this virus moment, that lights had been turned out emotionally, psychologically, physically, on many aspects of my life and the lives of 450 other householders who lost their homes in that fire. But at the same time, lights were being turned on and what seemed only to be a loss was actually an opportunity. And I think almost everybody I know at this stage in the virus is thinking, how has the virus woken me up to what I've been missing? How has it enabled me to reorient my, my habits and my priorities and actually go back into the life as, far, as well as I can uh, a little differently than I was living before? We began talking about um, habits, I think, and working from home because both of us do that. We practice social distancing for a living as, as writers. And when we talk about working from home, I think everybody knows that in the workplace you have certain priorities. But during the virus, we've been reminded that during home, at home, we have very different priorities that are more intimate and human priorities having to do with our emotional lives, our family lives, our inner lives. And now as people return to the workplace, maybe they'll see how the priorities of home can make the workplace a more humane place. And that this is what we need wherever we are. Um, what, what we've been reminded of um, during these last three or four months, which is, in my case, how wonderful it is to spend every minute of every day with my wife, to take walks around the neighborhood, to have more time to read, to be able to stop my working day at 3 p.m., uh, to be able to um, have more empty space, more time in my life, uh, to reclaim the things that in my rush to move and to fill my day with as much as possible previously, I was depriving myself of. So the forest fire and every challenge that's come my way has taught me what I think Japan has been teaching me, which is that we're only as rich as what we have inside us. That is what we have to bring to the suffering that is inevitable. Uh, and that's where we have to work to, to build up our resources. What ultimately sustains us. When I came back to my mother's bedside, my resume wouldn't sustain me or her. <laughs> my business card wouldn't help her, nor would my checkbook. The only thing I could bring to her was something to do with what I had got, gathered alone um, in quiet. And so all of us have been given the chance to build up our resources in that realm to bring back to the outer world. And certainly for those of us fortunate enough to return with our lives and our livelihoods a little bit intact, um, I think this is a great opportunity as well as um, an unexpected challenge. I can think of no better note to end on. Um, Pico, thank you. This has been marvelous. For me, primarily, I mean, I'm sure the readers and uh, viewers out there will enjoy it, but this has been a complete joy for me. So thank you so much for, for letting me talk to you for this long. Thank, thank you. This has really been the most stimulating conversation I've had for a long time, and I'm so honored <laughs> that um, such a, a writer I've admired for so long would be a part of it. And good luck to you with all your writing, uh, given what we were saying, that this is not the best climate for writers. Right, right. Uh, thank you, guys. Are we over now? Shri yep. Krishna? No, I was just okay. going to say thank you so much, uh, Pico. Thank okay. you, Saman. Uh, just such a delightful and lovely conversation. Uh, felt like we just, I was just listening to uh, two friends uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, it almost felt like uh, it was a book that the two of you were writing because there were a lot of things that I wanted to pause and say, I need to go back to that uh, when we're finished <laughs> with this. So... Thank you so very much.